false. Okay, um, so we'll get started now with the first lecture. Um, so this course is called um, Quantitative Big Imaging. Um, and this lecture will really be just sort of an introduction and overview to get everyone set up and at least started off on the same page and aware of the things that we'll try to do in this course. Um, so this year we'll be doing it a little bit differently as I mentioned in the mail. So all of the slides are available online and the slides will also be interactive. And so if you run them through the website using a tool called Binder, all the code in the slides will be executable in the slides itself. Um, so to start off, um, how many of you are familiar with Python at all? And MATLAB? And has anyone not programmed anything at all? One, okay. Um, R, okay. Well, R is also very similar for this, so that should be okay. Um, but so we um, are planning to have sort of two paths in the course. So previously we used a tool called NIME, where you can link everything together that we'll talk about. Um, and the main point of the course is really to understand the ideas, not to know how to implement a certain function in a certain language. It's to understand what operations and what tasks need to be done in what order. And the exercises will just serve to sort of solidify that. But the fact that a lot of you are already familiar with Python should make that much easier. Um, so could everyone go around and say sort of what you're taking the course for? Because for me, it's sort of helpful to know sort of, I guess, what your background is and what you're looking to get out of the course. And if it's four credit points, that's a perfectly fine answer. But potentially, we can make the more, course more interesting if you have a more detailed response than that. So do you want to start? Um, I'm uh, in the food process engineering lab with more support, yeah. uh, actually. Uh, two years ago, I actually visited the same course. Now I come back because I have my own big data generator. Uh, and uh, so I, I think it's quite useful to follow the course and at the same time work on my own project. Yeah. I leave some information and I get in there. Yeah. Cool. So Good as well. yeah. yeah. That works. I'm from Dehurst, I'm from Graf Media Group, yeah. and my PhD thesis is the shape and mechanics analysis of lacuna, which is very similar to what you've done. Yeah. So different papers, and, and I just want to learn how to do this in an organized way. Yeah. I just, just started my PhD about one year in, so I've just finalized my proposal, um, and this is the direction my thesis is going, so this is absolutely going to be the course that would help me. Okay. So, That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Toby. <coughs> I study geophysics, and geophysics is basically imaging the subsurface. Um, it's a measurement method. So um, I thought, yeah, after I measure it, would be also nice like to further process them beyond what we do as a geophysicist. Yeah. So I think it could fit quite well in my class. Cool. I'm Benjamin. I'm from Do you have any particular project you are interested? Okay. Yeah. Then we also have a number of. So if you don't have your own project, there's a number. I mean, there's basically unlimited, very cool projects that you can take data and try to analyze. So that's not a problem at all. Yeah. My name is uh, Nathan. I'm from uh, the Binder. My master's is in microlearning systems. And uh, next one is probably Toby next year for a different reason, but I would be interested to see the different systems and the analysis that they can do the course. Cool. Yeah. My name is Nathan, and uh, I'm majoring in biology. So I'm a biology major in biology. And I'm 
the one to on on the uh, more the usual interviews for uh, the end of the interview or that session. Yeah. So I'm I'm just a beginner but yeah, that's the end. Cool. Uh, my name is James. I'm doing a master's in environmental computing. And this semester I want to focus a little bit on machine learning and neural networks and I'm still still looking at or analyzing a little bit because it's quite big beyond these I'm the environmental engineering master and I want to just do a research analysis and evaluation of the project which I'm doing on the Google Cloud Analytics. Okay. something we cover a bit. My name is Gautam and uh, I'm doing my master's in electrical engineering. Um, I, I work, with, work on machine learning algorithms and uh, it's just a moment to learn more about uh, the application of machine learning. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm Ashwini and Cool. Um, so yeah, so it's quite a range of different backgrounds, um, but that's usually a good thing. Um, so to kind of the overview of what this lecture uh, will look like a bit, 
um, to sort of talk about who are we, so who are the people who made the course, and um, what is our background, what are our areas of expertise. Um, the next is then kind of who are you, so what people have taken this class before, and you know, not to be shocked if you're uh, feeling like you might not be prepared or over-prepared. And then sort of looking at kind of like, why does this class exist? And so we'll talk about a number of, uh, of the specific lectures we'll get into and sort of why it's important, you know, why is big imaging, quantitative imaging different than anything we've done before. So the overview will then sort of have, you know, what is an image to start very, very basically for those of you who've never heard of image analysis before, or to at least give everyone the same basic grounding in what's going on. A little bit about where do images come from. So this won't be a course on how CTs are produced or how MRIs are produced. Those are simply means that we'll talk about for getting the image data. But in many of these cases, it's very important to know how the images were acquired. Because if you're, for example, trying to get rid of noise and you have an understanding of the process that generated the noise, it's a lot easier to get rid of it than if you're just randomly guessing. Then we'll talk a little bit about science and reproducibility. So this will be kind of a theme that goes through the whole course in how you actually do work so that it's not just a script that ran on your computer once, but it's something that's actually reproducible by other people in your group, by other groups, and you have confidence that the results are meaningful because this is one of the, the major sort of crises that science is going through right now. And then specifically for that, we'll talk a little bit about workflows and what we mean by that. Um, so all the slides are online. We'll always be publishing it. Um, the lectures that I give will be screen recorded, which means you'll have the audio track. Um, apparently I talk too slowly and so some students play it back at double speed on their own, um, which is perfectly fine. I think it's better to potentially talk slightly too slowly and have people understand than to talk too quickly and maybe have people miss things. It's also helpful because then you can jump around in the video to parts that are more relevant for what you're doing or where you had problems understanding. And I strongly encourage asking questions as soon as you have them because you know that's why you come to the lectures to interact with it. If you just want to watch the videos at home, that's much easier. You don't have to wake up to do that. You can come here and actually ask questions and try to understand the material a little bit better. And most of the lectures are planned so that there's plenty of time to do that anyways. Um, so in terms of myself, so um, I'm, I made an ETH spinoff uh, now three years ago called 4Quant, which sort of does big image analytics. And so it's something I clearly am very interested in um, from a personal and career standpoint. Also lecture here. And formerly I was a postdoc, as some of you have already heard, um, in the X-ray microscopy group at ETH. We were also working very closely with Ralph Mueller's group in biomechanics. And so a lot of the examples that I present will come from biomechanics because that's where a lot of the data we have are from. Um, now, the company I'm at is working very closely with the hospital um, in Basel, and so we have a lot more medical examples that we'll show there, which might come up later. Um, so the teaching assistant, who's not here yet, um, Amoga, will be helping with the exercises and helping with sort of understanding of the problems and things. He um, works in this building in the, I think, H75 room. Um, and we'll have office hours set up. So if you have specific questions or questions on the exercises, you can talk to him. Um, next week will be the first guest lecture. And so that will be Anders Kastner. And he's a group leader at the Icon Beamline of the SYNC, so the Neutron Source at Paul Scherer Institute. And so he has quite good um, lectures on sort of cleaning up images and how you do that. Because when you make images with neutrons, you get very, very, very noisy images, and so it's a very important thing to do there. Boom. Um, then some of the other lectures, which still need to be finalized. Um, this is, I think, the only one we've got set up so far, is from Michael Prumer. So he's at the Nexus Center of ETH, and so he used to work um, as a senior imaging scientist at um, Roche doing 
drug discovery and high content screening. So has anyone heard of high content screening before? No one. Okay. Um, so high content screening is basically where you are testing out drugs on cells. And rather than doing one experiment on one cell, you have robots set up so that you can do thousands of experiments on thousands of different cell lines with thousands of different compounds. And so you end up with extraordinarily large amounts of data. And it's very important to manage this data and analyze it well so you can see which drugs worked or were harmful to which cells and study these things very quickly. Because it's very easy to come up with a new compound it's very time consuming to figure out if this compound is actually harmful. And so it's one of the areas where it's very important. And it's quite interesting because it's not simply a science problem. You know, they actually, their business model is based on efficiently finding compounds that don't kill cells and cure diseases. And so the better you can do this, the more reliably you can do this, the more money you can make. It's not about publishing papers at all. It's about actually getting your job done. Um, so for who are you? So of course this slide hasn't been adapted yet to the people in the course right now, but um, basically a wide range of people have taken this course before. So from biomedical engineers to art history researchers, and I think all of them, at least from the feedback we've gotten, were able to follow more or less the course and benefit from it. And so of course, depending on your specific skill set, you'll be learning different things in the course. But, you know, there's a wide range of skills coming into it to people who've just heard of MATLAB, to people who write optimized C++ in their free time, and everything in between. And so you shouldn't be concerned at all that your background isn't adequate for what we're doing, because the focus is really much more on the ideas and how do you solve problems, rather than any specific, you know, mathematical operation you need to know. So, yeah. Not at all. So, so the imaging, so the examples we'll take a lot of times will come from biology, but at no point in this course will we be talking about genomics and how it's important to understand sequences or mutations or something like this. So the entire course is really focused on imaging where the examples come from different fields. And so the examples don't only come from biology. So we also have examples from earth science where we have some data from a volcano erupting. Um, there's, of course, satellite images, which I think will be one of the exercises near the end. Um, there's no need to have any biology. Of course, if you have biology background, it's probably a little helpful to understand the motivation for some of the cases. Um, but yeah, often the exam questions are about how you would recognize a face on your student ID. And so that's no need to understand any biology for that. So in terms of how this will work, um, there'll be sort of adaptive assignments. Um, and so you'll see some of the assignments will be done as sort of IPython or Jupyter notebooks, uh, where you can run them either in the cloud or on your own machine or on these computers. Um, and there'll be other assignments where you use a tool called NIME, which I'll get into later, where you can actually just drag blocks and link them together. So it requires no programming experience. It just requires an understanding of which blocks go in which order. And then, of course, there'll be opportunities for sort of the more advanced or more accelerated students to tackle more difficult problems. And so we'll, you know, cover things like um, thresholding, like filtering and some of these processes, but we won't go into a huge amount of detail for the more complicated ones. And so if you feel comfortable with the material, you can sort of go into that yourself. You can experiment yourself and all of these tools are the same sort of standard tools professionals are using for these problems. And so the, there's really no upper bound on what you can do. Um, so terms of course expectations, there's usually one exercise set per lecture. Um, they're optional. Um, so you're not required to do any of the exercises at all. If you um, don't do them, it will potentially be a lot harder to really understand the material. So I would strongly recommend doing them. But you're obviously free to do what you wish. Um, 
they're sort of the easy and the advanced. And so the easy ones are generally very graphically oriented. Um, so they'll use tools like NIME and ImageJ. Um, I think lecture two, we've now moved entirely to Python. So that won't be an issue anymore. And then the more advanced ones will involve writing Python or Java or Scala, depending on the exercise. But most of them right now are in Python. Um, the next part is sort of the, the more important part. Um, so this is the science project. And so again, this is also optional, but it's about taking the material in the course and applying it to a very specific scientific question. So, um, you know, if you have a PhD project you're doing with lots of data that you need to analyze, this is obviously very well suited for a science project. But even if you're not, we have lots of example projects you can take where you have data to analyze and you can sort of apply the techniques we learn in this course to a real problem that you actually care about solving. You know that most of you probably don't care that much about how many cells are in this sample of bone. And so finding a problem that actually is somewhat interesting to you makes it a lot more engaging as a course. And so, you know, there's all kinds of very cool data sets. And if you've been following deep learning in general, you know, there's pictures of celebrities with 100,000 images of celebrities. And you can try to analyze if you can predict their age based on their face, or if you can predict race based on the image or something like these, um, this. And so the point is really to focus on what's a scientific question you're trying to answer, um, you know, relevant to you, and sort of what was your approach, your analysis, and your results. And so clearly, if you're doing something for your PhD project, you're not expected in the course of a semester to analyze everything you've done for your PhD and present that. It's much more of what are the challenges that lay ahead, what techniques do you think you can apply and how does that look? And I think the main point of this is really um, to kind of get you comfortable with presenting that. And it also lets sort of everyone else in the class benefit a little from you having taken a problem, studied it in more detail and tried to come up with solution. You can also get feedback from myself and other students on what you might do differently or how there might be similarities between this and another problem that could be useful for you. Um, so in terms of literature and useful references, um, this isn't really much of a textbook-based course. Uh, each lecture will have some references that you can look into if you're interested. Um, these are just sort of the, the first that come off the top of my head. Um, the top one, of course, is with R, and so if you're not familiar with R, it probably doesn't make sense to read that book. Uh, the second one is much more general, and it's also available online at ETH. Um, but Generally, this is not a, a book-driven class, and we'll have much more sort of relevant research articles or publications for specific things as they're introduced. Um, so for today's material, sort of that we'll look at, um, the cloud computing things, there's a few articles you can read on that. Um, and then reproducibility. And so these articles, if you're interested in learning more about reproducibility, or why it's a problem, or in the case um, of classes that are dedicated just to that, there's a class at John Hopkins where you can learn more about reproducible research and how you do this properly. Um, and so yeah, so if you look at these articles, you find much more of the statistics and sort of um, evidence that reproducible research is important and is a problem that needs to be addressed. So the motivation for this course um, is really to kind of understand how you get from the beginning to an end. And so, you know, for here we take, for this we take a very simple example of sort of a, a measurement from a bone. You know, there's a research group that are looking at femur bones. There's all of this stuff that happens in between. And then at some point you read in Blickham Aubin that science says ice cream is good for bones. And sort of what are all of those steps that take place? So, you know, from acquisition to this fancy magic math complicated things that happen in between so that you can actually come out at the end and say a statement like this. And so, of course, we won't ever be able to say anything that clear 
and we'll focus a little bit on sort of the basic statistical background for making claims like this. Uh, but the real focus will be on all those steps that happen in between and how you can do that in a correct and significant way. And then the part that really gets into the big data analysis of how do you do this analysis for 10, 100, or 1,000 images the same way you did it for one. Because doing it for one is, of course, interesting and useful, but if you really want to do significant research, you need to be able to scale up the processes you're doing without having a hundred times or a thousand times as much work as you would have had before. Um, the second kind of reason fitting into this is that um, detectors are getting bigger and faster constantly. Um, so I think there's only one person from the Tomcat group at Paul Scher Institute, but there's a number of other areas where this is also happening. But at the Tomcat group, the newest camera they have is able to produce sort of 2,500 by 2,160, 1,500 times a second and make 8 gigabytes of data a second. And so if you aren't using big data or scalable approaches to analyze this, you'll measure you know, as much data as I did in my PhD in two minutes. And then you'll spend the rest of your three, four, five, six years analyzing two minutes worth of data. And so how can you make sure that your analysis fits well with your measurement technique and is able to benefit and scale up to that? And yeah, as you see, if you have MATLAB, Aviso, Python by themselves, your memory is full in 60 seconds. And so how do you come up with a better solution for that? And so this camera, um, you know, captures more information a day than Facebook and gets three times as many images per second as Instagram worldwide. Potentially these numbers are a little bit out of date, but it's a huge amount of data, but it's not the only place that data comes from. Obviously, Facebook and Instagram have ways for dealing with this amount of data as well. And so understanding what their processes are is helpful for us. Um, so yeah, so here, X-ray, um, the top one, is sort of that Tomcat beamline at the Paul Scher Institute. Um, also at the Paul Scher Institute, there's another beamline that does diffraction, and they're able to collect 30 gigabytes of data a second. They rarely collect it at this size, but it does happen. Um, at the, I think, Soleil beamline in Paris, they get, you know, 10 terabytes a day which isn't quite as dramatic as um, a terabyte every two minutes, but it's still a huge amount of data to analyze. And you have single files that are from one, a 10 to 500 gigabytes in size. Um, in optical microscopy, you can also get very large images, so you can get 500 megabytes a second um, quite easily, and these cameras are also constantly improving. Um, High-speed confocal images can get 78, even GoPros can produce pretty impressively large data sets. Um, I think 400 megabytes a second if you were to analyze it at full resolution. And this was just the four. I think now there's the GoPro 6, and so that makes even more data. So when we look at kind of the motivation for all of this, we have this idea that experiments are divided into these different groups. So the first one's experimental design, the next is management, the next is kind of measurements themselves, and the final is post-processing. What we have, I don't know why that shows up so small, oh, okay. is this sort of breakdown of time. And so if you looked at 2000, you had, you know, a certain amount of time was dedicated to the experimental design, so thinking about what you were doing. Then you did your measurements, and they took, you know, maybe a quarter of the time you then had some post-processing and management of your data, or I'm sorry, management of your data, and then you finally had this post-processing step. And what we've seen is that as measurements have gotten faster and faster and faster, the division of this work has shifted massively. And so if we look at the 2000 era, here it was, you know, as a physicist, you were very well suited to do these tasks because it was about improving measurements and you spent a significant amount of time doing that. And now you're at the point where you sort of have all of these physicists who are trained for improving measurements who spend all day coding because the real challenge is about the post-processing 
And so it's kind of coming up with approaches and techniques to make that manageable. Um, so kind of how much is a terabyte really? And so if you looked at one thousand by thousand sized image, and we have an example of a thousand by thousand sized image here, every second, it would take you 138 hours to view a terabyte. And so it's way beyond the ability of sort of manual screening and investigation to look at a terabyte of data. Um, and so what I mentioned before about sort of the interactive slides, um, it's a bit ugly looking, but basically all of the figures in this presentation are generated in the slides themselves. And so when you're looking at the slides online, if you open them in the binder link, you can actually evaluate the code and update the figures. And so if you wanted to see, well, what does a 10,000 by 10,000 image look like? Not that that would look any different. But that you can then show and change those figures to make, uh, to understand better what's going on. It, yeah. So when you click on the link, it uses this tool called Binder, where it basically makes a copy of everything on a Google Cloud server and then connects you to it. You have to be aware of the fact, though, if you make changes, as soon as you disconnect and close it, those changes are gone. Right. Exactly. So you can go here in this presentation. So when you load it in that mode, um, you can click this button to go into presentation mode where you see the presentation. You can click the X to get out. And we'll go into this a little more detail. And then you have this file, download as IPython notebook, and then it will download onto your machine whatever changes you made. It's also good if there's typos or mistakes in the presentations, you can change them, save it, and send it to me, and I'll be very appreciative. Um, so all of the slides are completely editable like this at the trade-off that they don't look quite as nice. Um, and obviously for this, it's not nearly as valuable to have the code editable. I mean, this is not a very difficult problem. But as we get into techniques and you want to investigate some of these things we're doing more, um, I think it will be very useful to be able to edit and play around with the things interactively. And I think it's also, um, from a teaching perspective, quite a bit more honest to show you things that actually have code behind them, rather than just present ideas that might be interesting if someone wants to spend six months implementing them. And so here you're able to see that actually, if I say that's the size of the image, or if I say 138 hours, that that actually is derived from some sort of math, and that you can check that yourself if you don't think that um, a thousand by a thousand 16-bit image takes up that much. You can check that formula. I'm pretty sure it's right there. Anyways, um, so to get back to the sort of motivation for this course, um, this idea of kind of being overwhelmed, or what problems are we dealing with today? that are quite difficult. Um, I think it might be useful to turn the mic. Um, and the, also, uh, the normal way we do the class is to have sort of the first hour and then a break in the middle where you can ask questions or get up and get a coffee or use the restroom, and then the second hour, and then the exercises. And so the class, I think, goes officially between 9.15 and 12, and the first two hours are usually lecture, and the last hour is then working on the exercises. And so um, with this, 
that will change a little bit because you can start to play around with the slides a little bit more before we get officially to the exercises. But still having an hour time focused on the problem set and getting help with it, I think, is helpful. So back to this original problem we had. Sort of, you have this task, you know, this is a, an image you've acquired, and you're supposed to count how many cells are in the bone slice. And, you know, that's a reasonable task. You could go through and manually do it. It would take you a little while. Um, and that's okay. But if you now are told to go back and ignore the ones that are too big or strangely shaped, then you'd really have to go back from the beginning and count again. And if you now have a question like, are there more on the right side or the left side? Then you have to again go back from the beginning and start all over. And then finally, if you have a question sort of like, are the ones on the right or the left bigger? Or maybe is there a difference between top and bottom? Uh, you have to go back to the very beginning and run everything all over again. And so. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with working with biology groups, a lot of times when you are doing imaging experiments, you don't really know all the questions you want to ask until you've seen the data and got answers to the first ones. And so it's a very, very iterative process. And if every time you need to go back to the image and recount everything from the beginning, it's going to be incredibly time-consuming to iterate. And you'll find that more often than not, sort of the hypotheses that people produce are wrong. You know that the, bone, the ones here are more aligned because that's where the weight goes, and then you go and actually look at it. No, in fact, they're not more aligned at all. Um, so now, that was just one data set. So now if you have or one slice of one data set, now, if you go to sort of a, a smaller scale project we did early in my PhD, you now have to do that again for 96 samples and instead of just one slice to do it for 2,000 slices. And so clearly at this point, you're well beyond the ability of trying to count or do these things manually. This is, you know, would be years of time to just do that. And every time someone asks a new question, you'd have to redo it. And now to sort of go up to the Huge scale if you have to do this for 1,090 samples. This isn't anymore even a task you can do on your laptop or a powerful computer in the office. This is something where you'll want to distribute and do this quickly. Otherwise, you'll have to wait You know, for, I think, in the case of these samples, if you did them all in one machine, I think the estimate was something like six months to compute, which means that, you know, of course, you don't have to do it manually. You're running it on a server that has, or a machine that has lots of capacity, but if you have to wait six months to get the answer to your question, you're not going to ask very many questions. And if you can get your answer in 10 seconds, you're much more likely to play around with these data sets more. And then, sort of, this is more the quantitative than the big data aspect. Um, you know, those metrics were uh, quantitative and could be visually extracted, but a lot of the metrics, and again, this is in biology, but probably in earth science and other fields as well, what happens when you're trying to quantify softer metrics? And so, particularly when you're dealing with groups that aren't physicists or don't come from that sort of um, meteorological background, how do you quantify things that are very soft? And so here, when you look at something like alignment, you know, kind of aligned, well aligned, not really aligned, in a medical journal would be a perfectly acceptable thing to write. But if you have 1,090 samples and each sample has 2,000 slices, kind of aligned is very difficult to compare to not really aligned and well aligned. And you have the problem that when Joe says well aligned, it might be different than when Thomas says not really aligned. And so how do you deal with all that discrepancy and get sort of meaningful reproducible science results out of it? Um, of course, for dynamic information, it's very similar. Um, hopefully this works. 
think we have the video here, so I'll load it quickly. Um, so we sort of have this video of foam flowing. And, you know, for basic questions, if you were to ask, you know, how many bubbles are inside here? So here you don't actually see the bubbles themselves because the bubbles are air. You only see what are called the plateau borders, which are sort of the boundaries between bubbles, where the water gets collected, which is very common in these sort of cellular structures. And so you could look at this and start to come up with an idea of how many bubbles are inside that data set and maybe even count them. But of course, when you try to get more complicated things like how fast are these bubbles actually moving, then you have to count them at each time step and you have to figure out which bubble went to which position in the next time step. And then you get much more interesting questions about, you know, do the bubbles at the edge move slower than the bubbles in the middle? You know, is there some sort of flow profile you can generate? Is the material at the edge interacting with the bubbles or not? Is there pressure on the bubbles that's maybe causing their size or distribution to change? And so you very quickly get from something that's a very easy question, like how many bubbles do you have, to a very complicated question to answer. And then the final question here is the sort of are they rearranging? And so do you have bubbles that are changing which other bubbles they're touching? And that's a much more difficult question to try to answer. Um, so I think we'll take a short break here if there's no questions. Okay.